Good day, I'm Norman Wampiger. In today's video, we're going to look at the famous formula of Brett Schneider and von Stout for the quadria of a quadrilateral. This is a redo of a video where I talked about this subject, but I wasn't really quite as knowledgeable about the history of the subject as I could have been. And thanks to some very useful suggestions and information that I got from viewers, I'm able to redo this video with a little bit more accuracy. Okay, so we're talking about a quadrilateral in the plane and a very famous formula that illustrates the power of thinking rationally. In other words, the power of thinking in a rational way without any reference to real numbers or infinite processes that are implicit most of the time when we're doing real number arithmetic. Okay, so in particular, this quadrilateral, let's call it A1, A2, A3, A4, has quadrances QIJ. So QIJ is the quadrants between AI and AJ. Remind you that's the same as the square of the usual distance, or rather the distance is the square root of the quadrants. Okay, so there are six such quadrances formed by these four points, labeled like this. And we'd like to know a formula for the area of a general quadrilateral, not necessarily a cyclic one, like we've been talking about for the Brahmagupta and Robbins type formulas. Okay, so there is such a, a lovely formula, and here it is right here. Okay, it's the formula for the quadria of the quadrilateral. The quadria is 16 times the square of the area. That particular combination, for some remarkable reason, is the one that occurs many, many places uh, in this subject. So we give it a name, we call it the quadria of the quadrilateral. And here's the formula for it that was discovered by Karl Brettschneider and Karl von Stout, both in the year 1842, independently. It is that the quadri is 4 times Q13 times Q24, the product of the diagonal quadrants times 4, minus Q12 plus Q34 minus Q14 minus Q23, all squared. So it's a formula just involving quadrants, not involving distances, and it's a formula for the quadria of a general quadrilateral. And in my opinion, this is a top 50 formula. It's probably one of the top 50 formulas in mathematics. So it's one that should be well-known, and we should all understand the correct attribution of it. Now let me remark that when you have a quadrilateral in the plane, the six quadrances that are formed here are not independent. If you know five of them, then you can generally figure out the sixth one, or at least you can figure out the sixth one up to a uh, finite number of possibilities. For example, if we know Q12, Q23, Q34, and Q14, then we know the quadrilateral not at all in terms of its shape because it's flexible. But if we then know one of the diagonals, say Q24, then that fixes the shape of that triangle and that triangle, and so then the shape is pretty well rigid, except for the possibility that we could reflect this triangle in that diagonal that we know. Right? So there's really two possibilities once we know the five quadrants, and knowing that six quadrants then pins it down. This is also reflected in that formula of Tartaglia that I talked about in some previous video. It was a formula for the volume, or actually the square of the volume, of a tetrahedron. And when the tetrahedron collapses into the plane, we get a quadrilateral, and then the volume is necessarily zero. So there is a well-known relation between these six quadrants. Which means that we should expect that a formula like this is not unique. There very well may be other kinds of formulas involving these six quadrants that essentially express the area or the square of the area. Nevertheless, this is almost surely the best and most beautiful such formula. Here's the formula again. And I'd like to point out a very important special case. When two of the points 
coalesce. So if A3 equals A4, then the quadrilateral reduces to a triangle. And in that case, this formula reduces to something that's very familiar to us. So in this special case, when A3 equals A4, then what happens? Well, the Q13 is still there, but the Q24 is the same as Q23. The Q12 is before, the Q34 is now zero. And the Q14 is the same as Q13, and the Q23 is right there. And so what we get is just the formula that we've been calling Archimedes' theorem, which is an absolutely fundamental formula going back thousands of years, and it's a direct generalization of the triple quad formula for three points uh, on a line that we've discussed earlier, that we sort of motivated uh, a lot of this discussion. So in a very natural way, this is the most simplest and most elegant possible generalization of Archimedes' theorem to the quadrilateral situation. Another interesting special case that's worth pointing out is when the quadrilateral degenerates to four points in a line. In that case, the area of the quadrilateral is obviously zero. And so the formula takes the form that 4Q13Q24 equals Q12 plus Q34 minus Q14 minus Q23 all squared. So that's telling us something about the quadrants is formed by four points on a line. That's something that we didn't know before. We have talked about four points on a line, and we've talked about the four quadrants that we get when we cycle through those four points from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and then back from 4 to 1. Those four quadrants satisfy the quadruple quad formula. Here we see that if we look at the other two quadrants as well, namely Q13 between A1 and A3, and Q24 between A2 and A4, then those six quadrants will satisfy this simpler relationship. That's another interesting special case. And this is another extension of the triple quad formula that we started out uh, by motivating the entire subject. Uh, which was 4Q13, Q23 equals Q12 minus Q13 minus Q23 all squared for three collinear points A1, A2, A3 and the quadrants is Q12, Q23, and Q13. So I'd like to present to you a proof of the Brett Schneider von Staudt formula. Uh, before I do that, I think it's sensible to start with a proof of Archimedes' theorem since that's a smaller, sort of more special case. And also of course, of great independent interest. We've seen a proof of this in the case when we have three points on the unit circle. Let's have a look at the general case. We have three points A1, A2, A3. We're going to proceed just by writing down both sides of the equations and then seeing that they're equal. The quadria of the triangle is four times this expression squared. The triple quad function applied to Q1, Q2, and Q3, which are the quadrants formed by these three points, is defined by this expression. It's the asymmetric form. 4Q1, Q2 minus Q1 plus Q2 minus Q3 squared. And maybe I should remark that sometimes I write Q1 plus Q2 minus Q3 squared, and sometimes I might write the same thing as Q3 minus Q1 minus Q2 all squared. But because there's a square there, it doesn't matter if I change what's inside by multiplying by minus 1. Of course, there's also a symmetric version of that, namely Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 all squared minus 2 times Q1 squared plus Q2 squared plus Q3 squared. This asymmetric form is sometimes easier to work with because it's a bit shorter. All right, so we just write down the various things. There's 4, there's Q1, which is the quadrants between A2 and A3. So it's X3 minus X2 squared plus Y3 minus Y2 squared. That's the definition of the quadrants between these two points. Purely algebraic, only involving addition, subtraction, multiplication. No infinite processes required. 
there's the Q1, there's correspondingly Q2, and then we subtract the expression with Q1 here, plus Q2 here, and minus Q3 here. Okay, so what does the proof consist of? The proof consists of taking this expression here, expanding it, and then saying that, in fact, it can be rewritten to give you the quadria A. This is something that a computer can do in an instant. So if you input this into your computer and ask it to factorize that or simplify, maybe with Sage or Maple or Mathematica or MATLAB or Scientific Workplace or MuPad or GeoGebra probably also. Right. So they will do this in a flash, it will factorize this for you and that's basically the proof. In this case it's not impossible to work this all out by hand, especially if you sort of know beforehand that you're going to get a square and you're looking for uh, this expression squared. It's a purely algebraic, almost automatic proof. It's really, in some sense, trivial for a computer. But one should be appreciative that it's, a, in some sense, a deep algebraic identity. We're talking about one polynomial expression equaling another polynomial expression. On the surface, those things are quite different, yet remarkably, they're actually the same. So there are many such polynomial identities that play a role in mathematics, and I think in the future uh, century and so, we're going to see many, many more such polynomial identities uh, assert themselves as really core objects in our understanding of geometry, certainly, but probably other areas of mathematics as well. So that's a proof of Archimedes' theorem. All right, so now let's graduate to a proof of the Brett-Schneider von Stout formula. We proceed in exactly the same fashion. We write down four points in general position. So we have these various variables, x1, x2, y1, y2, etc. Then we write down the quadria of the quadrilateral, which is very similar to the quadria of a triangle, except that there's sort of one more additional term here. So we have one term coming from A1, A2, one term coming from A2, A3, that one there, one from A3, A4, that one there, and this one here from A4 and A1. So it's all of that squared times 4. And on the other side, we have this expression for Q13, Q24 minus Q12 plus Q34 minus Q14 minus Q23, all squared. Right, so we just substitute in. What is Q13? It's the quadrants between these two. So that's x3 minus x1 squared plus y3 minus y1 squared. So there is q13. And there is q24. And then we have to subtract a big bracket, all squared, which contains inside q12 plus q34 minus q14 minus q23. The assertion is that if you input this into your computer and then you press the factor button or the simplify button or whatever it is, then boom, it will output exactly this expression for you, which is the quadria A. So it's another lovely triviality in some sense, or at least your computer certainly makes it look like it's a triviality. But in years gone by, if you just had to take this expression and simplify it yourself, unless you knew what the answer was beforehand, it might be quite a challenge. But it's another remarkable uh, kind of uh, identity, uh, again, playing the essential role in explaining why this thing works from this point of view. Now, that's not to say that there aren't other proofs. There are, of course, other proofs. But in some sense, this is a very simple-minded one. Right? Almost no thinking is required. It's almost automatic. You just proceed down the road and you do the obvious things and you let the computer find the, the miracle that uh, is actually responsible for things. So this is actually a very powerful way of proceeding. And I think it's going to change people's attitudes towards geometry. Right. This idea that we can look for relations by looking for, for identities, 
that we can get our computers to help us, not just verifying the identities, but also ultimately finding them as well. This is a more subtle point, but it's not impossible these days for your computer, if you just input the various quadrants, namely these expressions, and you input the quadria as another expression, if you have a good program, or maybe with a bit of skill, you are in a position for getting your computer to actually find this relation. It's a very interesting uh, aspect, closely connected to a uh, very modern development uh, called Grobner bases in, uh, in algebraic geometry, which we might talk about uh, at some future point. So anyway, a very interesting new kind of algebraic orientation to what does it mean to actually prove something in geometry these days, purely algebraically and avoiding all mention of any infinite quantities. So let me say a few words about the history of this interesting result. So this formula of Brett Schneider and von Staudt, discovered independently by these two uh, fine German geometers, uh, it has resurfaced quite a few times. And uh, I have a number of people to thank for various investigations and uh, enlightenments that have been passed on to me. And in particular, I would like to uh, pay special thanks to Martin Josephson, who is a maths and physics teacher in the south of Sweden, who also works uh, doing some research in quadrilaterals, who basically oriented me in uh, a good direction with respect to a lot of the history here. Okay, so amongst the people who have rediscovered this formula, and sometimes it's attributed to them. Um, one of them is a mathematician named Dostor, who wrote down the formula in 1848, just shortly after Brett Schneider and von Staudt. By the way, Dostor, according to uh, Martin Josephson, is also actually responsible for Robin's formula for the non-convex Brahmagupta type formula for the area of a cyclic quadrilateral. That's a very other interesting uh, kind of aspect relating to a, one of our previous videos. So um, one might look more carefully at the work of this fellow. It seems that somewhat this result of Brett Schneider and von Staudt has sort of dropped off the radar at, at points because as I mentioned in the last iteration of this video, it resurfaced as a problem in the problems section of the American Mathematical Monthly in 1960. It was problem E1376. And at that time I thought that's perhaps actually where the problem originated. But now we know that no, it's in fact a 19th century result that goes back to uh, two very important uh, German geometers. This uh, theorem, formula of uh, Brett Schneider and von Staudt, is also discussed in Petsch's book Selected Topics in Geometry with Classical versus Computer Proving, which was published in 2007. In this book, Petsch uh, deals with uh, a number of classical uh, formulas in geometry with the idea of having a look at sort of automatic computer type proving. Very much I guess suppose in the direction of the kinds of things we're, we're, we're talking about in the, in the previous uh, proofs. So I haven't actually seen this book, but I look forward to having a look at it. And for those of you who find this uh, topic interesting, I think this is a very uh, future-looking, uh, sounding kind of book, and I'm, I'm looking forward to having a, a read of it. Of course, there are many other formulas for a quadrilateral. It's a very interesting subject which I hope to uh, discuss uh, at greater length probably either in the Wild Trig series at some point or in my Universal Hyperbolic Geometry series at some point. But I'd like to at least mention two other classical formulas that are very much in the direction of the Brahmagupta kinds of results that we started about talking about. So here's a formula for the area of a general quadrilateral. A, B, C, D, in terms of a Brahmagupta type formula. But this time it's a general quadrilateral, not a cyclic one. So Brahmagupta's formula says that the area of a cyclic quadrilateral is the square root of these product here, where S is the semi-perimeter sum of the four lengths of the sides divided by two. 
but in this formula we augment that by subtracting an additional term which is a b c d referring to the four lengths now of the sides times cos squared of alpha plus gamma over 2 where alpha is say this angle at the point a and gamma is this angle opposite it at the point c all of that over 2 okay so this formula involves things called angles and officially we don't know what angles are because we haven't defined them for a very good reason and officially we don't know what this cosine object is either because we haven't defined that either also for a very good reason but nevertheless if you're kind of willing to be happy with a bit of hand waving then you can take the usual meanings of these things and you get some formula like this and uh, it reduces to Brahmagupta's formula because in the case of the cyclic quadrilateral uh, it's known that this angle and this angle, provided they make sense, add up to 180 degrees or, or pi. And then uh, pi over 2 has the property that its cosine is a zero. And so that then makes this second term disappear and we go back to Brahmagupta's formula. Alright, so this is an attractive uh, result for sure. And its uh, a, a proper attribution is to Brechtschneider and Strelke also in 1842. So that same paper of Brechtschneider and another independent paper of Strelke in 1842 where this formula was established. And I thank Martin Josephson uh, again for that information. And then there's a similar kind of formula where this term here with the transcendental circular function and the angle reference is replaced with this term here one quarter AC plus BD plus PQ where P and Q are the diagonal lengths times AC plus BD minus PQ and we see uh, another connection with the cyclic situation because in the cyclic situation Ptolemy's theorem says that AC plus BD equals PQ and so that term is going to be zero this formula is, as far as I know, due to the uh, geometer and historian of geometry, J.L. Coolidge, in 1939. And of course, there are many other formulas. Euler spent uh, a bit of time thinking about formulas for uh, quadrilaterals, and there are many others. So this is actually a, a beautiful uh, topic of investigation that hasn't seen nearly as much uh, development as the triangle geometry situation which of course now is is very much developed and, and very rich subject so uh, I think there'll be some catching up to do in the quadrilateral world uh, still many many beautiful things to be discovered about quadrilaterals and I think important connections with both mathematics and physics now it's important to point out that there really is a huge difference between the original formula that we talked about the Brett Schneider von Staudt formula for the quadria of a uh, general quadrilateral and these other formulas that I just showed you now due to Brett Schneider and Strelke and Coolidge. This first formula is a proper result of pure mathematics in the sense that all the ingredients are pinned down precisely. We're talking about quadrants in the plane we know exactly what that means we can compute that exactly there's nothing ambiguous about it whatsoever we can work just in the rational setting no infinite processes no ambiguities whatsoever and we can demonstrate the solidity of this by verifying the theorem in special cases and I'm going to shortly ask you to do that in distinction the other formulas on the previous slide involve notions like distances, square roots, angles, transcendental functions. These are all objects that ought to be in quotes. Their definitions are all problematic. In fact, seriously problematic. So much so that they render the results actually only approximate statements. I would go so far as to say that they belong to applied mathematics and not in fact to pure mathematics. They are both very valuable and interesting formulas from an applied mathematics point of view. You can verify them from an applied point of view by actually drawing a picture 
and getting out a ruler and making some measurements of distances and getting out a protractor and make, measuring some angles and so on. And you can verify up to a certain amount of discrepancy because of the measurement process that things work. But if you actually want to get an exact verification by choosing four random points and then computing the left and the right hand sides, you will see, as I think you're probably familiar by now, that the square roots involved and the angles involved and the transcendental functions and the distances involved render this very problematic because the formulas are asking you to finish infinite processes which you cannot actually do. And the best that you can do is some floating point approximations to things, which means that you can't actually verify this thing in a generic case. So there is in fact a big difference between these two kinds of formulas. We shouldn't lump them together. Okay? One is definitely on a different level than the others. The Brett Schneider von Stout formula is on a separate level. It's a rational formula. All right, so three exercises for you. The first is to verify the Brett Schneider von Stout formula in some special cases over the rational numbers. So pick four points with integer coefficients, say, to make life easy, in the plane, and then compute the quadria using the formula for the quadria. Compute the quadrances and then apply the formula and see if indeed the quadria is really given by the formula. There's something satisfying about doing that, I think. To see that everything actually does work out just as the formula claims that it does. The second exercise, I want you to do the same thing but to work over a different underlying field. Say, the field of seven elements that we talked about uh, in one of our last videos, where everything is reduced mod 7, or you basically set 7 equal to 0. So you can go through the same exercise, but now the computations are easier because, well, whenever you see a 7, you can replace it with 0. So it's easier to actually verify it in, uh, in the situation where you have, say, some finite field. And you can try F7 or F11 or F13 or see how you go. And now a little bit uh, in a different direction, and also sort of opening up some new doors, I hope, for you, is to show that in the red or relativistic geometry, where we change the quadrants, instead of having x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared, we have a minus sign here. That's the new kind of quadrants between these two points. That then, there is a replacement for the Brett Schneider von Stout formula which is almost the same, but not quite. So you can still take four points, you can still take that same formula for the quadria, that doesn't change. But now the quadrants are going to look quite different from what they did before, because you're going to compute them using this formula. And then you can check that it's minus the quadria, which is 4q13, q24, minus q12, plus q34, minus q14, minus q23, all squared. Uh, suggesting that when we change the metrical structure that in fact the nature of the formula isn't changing that much. There's just some kind of little compensating factor that comes in there that is a small adjustment so that the formula in its essence is still valid. You might like to prove that uh, in general or get your computer to prove it. All right, so this is very interesting. In our next uh, video, I want to go a little bit more in, in, this, in this direction. I want to talk about the, the various roles of lengths and areas and in higher dimensions volume that we've been implicitly talking about when we've been talking about one-dimensional affine geometry, two-dimensional affine geometry, and a little bit about three-dimensional affine geometry. So there is a very strong orientation that the modern student of mathematics has that says that the proper measurements of linear and planar and solid objects are lengths, areas, and volumes. I'm going to have to try to change your point of view on that just a little bit. All right. 
So we've already been doing that a little bit. You probably know by now that lengths is not really the right thing, that quadrants are better. And you've already getting used to the idea that areas not always the best, that these quadrias sometimes uh, seem to work uh, best. And so we're gonna have to look at this whole situation in sort of a bigger picture, thinking about dimensions uh, relating to each other. So we're really getting at the fundamental nature of what we measure when we're doing pure mathematics in a geometrical setting. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.